I am Vinny Tullerith, and folks, your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent when we start this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean, guaranteed. Uh, folks, it's the Monday show, and it's the first Monday show of the new year. Um, so we're going to be talking about New Year's resolutions and where we're heading for the next year and on and on and on. Uh, but to do that, we have to bring in the beautiful Miss Anna Vocino. Hello. Well, they love you, Anna. They really do. They um, really do. Those little people that live in your roadcaster really love me. There they are again. They oh, man. Oh, the crowd goes wild. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when Andy's on, you hear a lot of this. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, listen, Anna, it is the new year. Boom. It's the new year. I mean, uh, I did a show yesterday with um, with Gina. We recorded that several weeks ago. And I don't remember much about it, but we did talk a little bit about what her resolutions would be for this year mm -hmm. and a little bit about mine. But this might be the first show that anyone's hearing for the new year, you know, because people, you know, it's, it, New Year's Day happened on a Saturday and, you know, everyone was drunk on a Sunday. This is probably the first show from us that they will actually hear. I always say now that we've been doing this for over 10 years, whatever that first Monday falls on in January is the day that people recommit to their NSNG. Yeah, because it's not, not going to happen on the first or the second this year. It's going to happen today. Right. Today is the day because people go, you know what? You know, I got drunk on a Saturday, hair of the dog, blah, 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 Sunday football. Right. Then I had Sunday brunch. Then I had the thing. Yeah. yeah. So all of the resolutions start today. Now, I I will do mine second. Now, I'm, I'm quite sure you probably don't even have your resolutions because we're doing this show two weeks early because of travel schedule. But do you want to talk about yours, because I, I will tell everybody the process I go through, because I think it's really helpful. Yeah, well, I'll talk about mine. Okay, first, and then and I'll then do we, my we, process. You can go through Anna's process. Great. First and foremost, um, most years, like everyone else, it's about either giving up something or doing something for my health. Now, when you're me and you live <laughs> like, uh, you know, the gimp in, in, a, in some kind of basement somewhere, there's not a whole lot to give up. But I've done years of no life into living this Meaning kind of not even one bite of sugar or grains the whole year. That's what not, no life not, into living means. Not a sip of wine, not a oh, let me taste your beer. Right. My birthday, no cake. Don't steal a French fry off someone else's plate. I don't do that anyway. Why am I I'm talking about like this? But on and on and on. You know, like there's there's zero on those years. I, there, there is nothing but high fat, high protein, no carbs whatsoever. Uh, oh, let, let me clarify. Um, cruciferous vegetables are always left in there. But, you know, you don't look at broccoli or cauliflower and go, oh, yeah, that's putting life into living. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to binge and have some cauliflower and broccoli. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to whiz it up in a blender and just drink it down like a shake. Yeah, no one ever does that. Cold vegetable no. soup. Yeah. So that, you know, that's not putting life into So I'm not saying zero carbs. I'm saying no life into living. I, I'm, I eat straight. There's no, nothing, just nothing in there. Are you doing that this year? No, I'm not. Although I live pretty close to that anyway. So in those yeah. years when I do that, it's not like I'm doing a whole lot. Um, where would carbs, if people go, well, if you're not doing, if, you, if you're putting a little life into living, what do you do then? Okay. Um, just for example. I'm going to be with my sister-in-law. Um, we're staying at her house uh, next week, right? Here. Yeah, well, which has already happened because we're doing the show early. Uh, I have a rule. If I'm looking at Kristen Scott Thomas, I can drink wine. Why? I don't see her very often. If I see her once a year, it's a lot. Because of COVID, I haven't literally laid eyes on the woman in two years unless one of her movies happens to come on television. I go, oh, my God. Right. 
Yeah. But you can't. But you have to see her in person. You can't watch yeah, the I, English I, patient I, and drink some wine. Right. Exactly. I can't do horse whispering. Oh, that's Kristen. Glug, <laughs> glug, glug. Yeah. Sister-in-law. Honey, uh, I need a glass of wine and I need my copy of Under the Purple Moon or whatever that movie was. <gasps> she was. She the was Prince a movie. Oh, I know. I told you Under the Cherry Moon. I wrote a paper <laughs> on it. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. My junior year in college in French. I've never, I've never actually seen it. Um, so at any, at any rate, you know, like if I, you know, see Chris, I have, you know, maybe on Super Bowl Sunday, if someone goes, man, I have the world's best IPA, you got to taste this. Oh my God. I might have a sip. If Tallulah says, I just made this blah, blah, blah. It's your birthday. I'm going to have a slice. That's me putting life into living. It's not, Hey, every weekend I have a thing or once a month I do a that. It's when life comes along and I decide, okay, this is worth me doing because my daughter, this is important to her and I want to enjoy that experience with her. Uh, or I'm with Serena and her sister and there's this bottle of wine. I'm, okay, I'm not going to be the one going, oh no, uh, I'm not going to have any of that Petra's, you know, just put it away. You know, no, I'm going to just have a glass and enjoy it. And, you know, I'm not going to feel guilty. On non life into living years, all of that has cut out. That's the difference. I've done years where I said I'm going to do some race on a bicycle, could be a three, four, 500 mile nonstop race. That means every day before I do everything else, I have to wake up before daybreak and get on my spinner or go outside and get on my bike and do certain exercises to get me ready to get there. Those are New Year's resolutions, right? I'm resolving to do something to change my life. Um, on and on and on. This year, I'm not really doing something to better my physical being. But what I think is going to better my mental being. Um, as I told the story on, on, on the Sunday show, I think I told the story, I, I've done so many shows in a row now to try to get ahead here. I was watching a Rob Lowe movie. I was on my spinner, speaking of my spinner. I see the movie Class, and I went, oh, I remember liking that movie when, when it came out in 1982 or 83. I pulled it up, Jacqueline Bissett is in it, or is it Bissett? I don't know how she says her name. I think it's Bissett. Yeah. So she's in the movie and oh, she's hot. And back then she's super hot. I'm going to watch <laughs> this movie and, um, and see if it rekindles, you know, what I thought it was in 83. Of course it did not, but I'm on the spinner and it doesn't take a lot of movie to keep me interested when I'm on the spinner. I'll leave anything on such is the case with this movie. Rob Lowe is driving a brand new red, 1983 Porsche 911 Cabrio. And man, look at that. That's when I used to like the 911s. I don't like what they look like now. Mm -hmm. Like what Porsches have become. Yeah, I get it. Everything has to progress and all that. And that's fine for someone else. Back in the 80s, boy, that's when that car really was hitting its stride for me. Maybe it's because I was the right age to go, oh my God, look, it's a beautiful car. Who, who knows? But I started reliving that moment, going, man, Jacqueline Bassett is hot, and that car. I didn't know what I wanted to see on the screen more, Rob Lowe's car or Jacqueline Bassett. It, 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 was, it was nip and tuck. So then over the next couple of days, I started pulling it up, you know, first on Instagram. Let me see. It. Look at this car, man. It's beautiful. I'm looking at it from different angles, and I'm really loving it. And then all of a sudden, I said, you know, Tallulah's not in school, not that I paid for it. You know, she's graduating, you know, I could probably afford to get one of these. I started looking them up. And some of them cost as much as $150,000, all fixed up like brand new showroom. Wow. And other ones cost like 25,000. So what's course, Lauren doing with Jeeps? I have no idea. She should be doing Porsches. So I'm looking at it going, wait, I can buy a $25,000 version of it fix it up mm -hmm. for a minute, I will lose my enjoyment of it. 
and I can sell it for a lot of money. Because right. knowing me, I'm going to fix it up correctly. So I can make this a really good investment. And I'm, I'm looking at things and I'm looking at these cars. Oh, this one's 22,000. This one's 27,000. You know, I'm going down that rabbit hole. But as I'm going down that rabbit hole, I'm getting more and more uneasy and upset. And I couldn't understand why I was getting uneasy and upset. And then it hit me. It hit me like a ton of bricks. I don't want a Porsche. I've never actually wanted a Porsche. And every time I've actually had a car, by the way, Anna, for some reason, when you move back, you're you're washed out. Oh, it's the light. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to let you know. Um, it's all right. I guess I'll sit up straight and pay attention, Vin. Well, you know, or you can be washed out. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was getting more and more uneasy. And it's like, every time I buy a car, and I think it's going to make me happy. Like I did with my car vets three times over the years, never had them as my only car. It wasn't my daily drivers that, you know, I would buy them and oh my God, this is, this is going to be so cool. And I end up not driving them. All I do is worry about them and pay insurance on them. And then I, I, I get enough and I sell it. it. Turns out it wasn't worth it. And I realized that this Porsche is not going to make me happy because a car, a possession like that has never made me happy. Ever. Period. Mm, that's so, very telling. Huh? I said that's very telling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking, what would make me happy? I like climbing mountains. I like doing this kind of thing. I like doing sports. Uh, and I said, you know, I've done all that. Yeah. And, you know, and Coddington and I will probably put something on the books for this summer, or maybe I'll finally get my kayak and go do some stuff and all this kind of stuff. So I said, kayak, wait a minute. I've never done the Bayou. And I can put that on my schedule. But again, I got to go train for all that. And I gotta, and maybe I will, maybe I won't. I don't know. But kayak kept coming in my head. And I said, you know what? I'm always dreaming about being that guy that builds the boat. You know, you, you see, I want to say it was a movie, Muscle of Dogs, where he, you know, he's, he's dating, what's her name? And Uma the, Thurman. No, it's not Uma Thurman. The hot oh, chick, Diane Lane. Diane Lane, the, the hot chick with the cankles. Um, <clears throat> he's dating, and, and he. The hot he, chick with the cankles. She's got cankles. She's Does she? she's a smoke show, but she's got she's got big thick ankles. Yeah. Okay. The kind only <laughs> Joe Clinton can love. Um, and me, and me. Anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he builds boat. You know, like he's got this garage and he builds boats and all that. I said, you know what? That's what I'm going to do. I've talked about building a boat before and I, I see it in movies and I romanticize about it. And I always talk about, Oh, one day I'm going to blow glass. I've always wanted to do something. Not I'm not an artist, right? Like Lois over there. She's an artist. This yeah, one yeah. Oh, legit. To, yeah. She's trying to help me design a hat and the whole thing. And, She's an artist. I'm not an artist, but I, I can do artisan type things. You know, I'm good with I can do stuff with wood. I, like I said, I've always wanted to take a class where you learn how to blow glass. But here I am coming up on 60 years old this year. I've done none of it because it's always one of those things where you go, I'm going to do it one day. But that one day never comes. Same mm -hmm. thing happened. Look, in the early 1980s, I learned about ultra cycling and a race across America and all these long races. And I said, you know what, one day I'm going to be really rich and I'm going to do that. And then I hit 30 years old. And I went, you know what, I'm never going to get rich because I'm a PE teacher. And if right. I want to get on with my life, I need to hop on that fucking bike and start doing it. Right. Right. And that's what I did. And I really enjoyed it. And it turns out you don't have to be rich. And, and guess what? <clears throat> no one who was riding the bike out there was mega rich. Right. Everybody was just working class people who found time to deal with family, deal with work, and still find time to train copious amounts of hours. We can do this. We were talking about that on the show about a week ago. We can find time to do things. Right. We, we just can. It, it, it is what it is. Now, I started thinking about this kayak, and I was like, okay, I can build it in my garage. I'm going to have to get some kind of lathe. I'm going to have to get some of this. And, that. I'm gonna, and that's the thing. Yeah. There we go. I got to buy equipment. 
And that's, I might as well buy a Porsche. See, my mind kept going back and forth. What am I willing? You know, and then I started thinking, oh, wait, Joey shot. This guy, I, I spoke to Joey during the pandemic. And I even went down and visited Joey and he actually put me in a cedar strip kayak that he had built. Mm -hmm. We went paddling around and I fell in love with these boats. And Joey did say to me, he goes, man, I'm a big fan of the show. If you ever want to come here and build a boat, you can use all of my equipment. I'll show you how, you know, we can work, we can build it together. I'll teach you how to do it. And I went, I wonder if he was serious about that. I wonder if that was just him going, Hey man, you're a nice guy. You come. I wonder if he would let me not build a boat for me, but me go in and maybe be his apprentice and the whole thing. So I called Joey and I said, Joey, how much hands on can I do? And he goes, all of it. He goes, oh. in fact, I'm not going to even have the strips cut down by the company. We're going to just buy cedar boards. You're going to cut the strips yourself. Oh. He's got all the saws. Cool. He's got all of the equipment. He's got this whole thing. And he's about an hour and a half, maybe an hour and 15 minutes away from me. I just have to drive there and I'm going to just commit once a week to go to Joey's shop. Now, sometimes if I could take a, a Saturday, Sunday, I'll take a Saturday, Sunday, I'll go twice. Mm -hmm. But I will commit to building a Cedar Strip kayak in the first half of this year. I That's think super cool. Yeah. So for me, this year is not about giving up something. It's about doing something where, you know, I'm getting older and you go, when, when are you going to do this, man? When, when are you planning on doing this project you've been thinking, not talking about, but a project that you've been thinking about your whole life? When do you get to be that guy, right? right. In Must Love Dogs. What, what was his name? Um, I don't remember. God, he's the guy that I kept running into. John Cusack. John Cusack, yeah. Okay. I kept running into him in bathrooms. You know that story, right? Yeah. Yeah. For the audience, real quickly, I, I was somewhere in Brentwood, California, and, and um, I walked into a bathroom, and it was just a one stall thing. He forgot to lock the door, and Cusack was washing up, and he's like, oh, sorry, man, I'll be out of you in a sec. So I waited, and he came out. A few days later, I'm in a coffee shop. I run in to go to the bathroom, like about five miles away, by the way. It wasn't in the same. I walk into the bathroom. I walk into the stall. The guy at the next stall. John Cusack. Hey, man, hey, yeah, yeah. Guy gave each, we gave each other the guy nod. Yeah. In Malibu, a couple of days later. And uh, I'm taking a leak. I'm at that Greek restaurant that was in Malibu. I don't know if it's uh, something Greek, maybe the Great Greek or something. <clears throat> and um, I'm in there taking a leak. Door swings open. John Cusack walks in. He goes, dude, I swear I'm not following you. <laughs> he was having the same thought too. I keep running into this guy. Yeah. Right. You see, I kept going, Oh my God, I'm running into John Cusack because he's, he's a celebrity. I'm nobody, but he was noticing me in the same bathroom. Right. So at any rate, must love dogs. Yeah. I want to, I want to be able to, to do something like that. I want to say I made this right. I wanna get in. I want to float down a river. Right. That might not sound like much of, of some kind of New Year's because I'm not making some kind of resolute. I'm going to change my life. This should be life changing. And that's what I'm doing. I'm doing something for me that's going to be life changing. And for you, it could be anything. It could be Anna and I were talking about saving money on a show a few weeks ago. It could be about changing your diet, trying an SNG. Maybe, hey, I'm going to exercise for the first time. Right? As long as you're alive, as long as you have a breath to breathe, you got stuff you can do, right? Always. Yeah, look, I started doing exercises again that I never thought I would do in my life ever again. You know, after I got my shoulder fixed, I started messing around and, and my shoulder moves better than I can ever move it, right? It's better than the original shoulder. It's better yeah. than my, my bad my good How You couldn't do that years ago. Oh, it was stuck by my side. We were I like... <laughs> I'm doing things like, you know, cleans, uh, you know, it's like, I, I haven't done a clean in 20 years, because I couldn't do that with my arm. And when I got back to moving it and, and rehabbing, it's like, why, why do cleans? And then I'm at the gym one day, I was like, why not? Why right. not? I don't have to do them heavily. You know, back right. when I was in college, you know, you, oh, I put 180 pounds in and do some cleans. No, 
No, just put some light weight on and just do it. You know, you can. Right. I don't want to feel like I'm ever getting too old that I can't do something. Right. Because yeah. that's when you start limiting yourself. And then next thing you know, you're dead. Right. So that's my New well, Year's resolution. What's that's the your, thing. Well, I don't know. I feel like human, we as human beings always desire more. Mm -hmm. We want to do more. We want to be more. We want to have more. We want to experience more. I will say the older I get, the, definitely the much, I always had an instinct that it wasn't about possessions um, for me. And now I know that for sure that that's true. And also too, uh, I feel like we just always want to, I don't know, don't you want to just keep, that? not that just like what keeps us on this earth doing things? <laughs> is that desire to create something new, to have a new experience to do anyway, not to get all philosophical, but uh, no, I use this book and I like the process and I've talked about it before. It's very cheesily titled. It's called your best year yet by a woman called Jenny Ditzler. And it's a process. And every year I think I already know this process. I'm not going to do it. And then every year I do it. I'm really glad I did. And part of it is to go back. Like one of the steps is to go back and, and I use my calendar because I calendar everything is to go back and look at your entire year and write down your successes, your triumphs, things that felt good, things that worked out well, you know, the things that you achieved, or at least the, you know, if you partially achieve something, you know, write it all down for the whole year because you forget. And I look at the calendar because I really do forget. Like I, you can't possibly keep things in your brain. And then you go, oh my God, I did, I accomplished way more than I thought, you know? And then you do the same thing and you write down where things didn't really work out and what, what went wrong and what, you know, and what did you, what did you learn from that? And then you go through a process and it's pretty darn illuminating where you kind of see what subconsciously the beliefs you've been holding and how they've been holding you back. And you pick three new paradigms to create for yourself in the new year. And so just right there, I generally, it's helped me to break unconscious patterns in myself, keeping me from achieving things. Cause we all have had those things on our list and losing weight is a big one for people. I'm going to lose weight. This year is going to be different, but until you can like, look and see what is it underneath, like what's keeping you from doing the thing. There's right. something there because or else you would just give up sugars and grains and do the thing. But Anna, can I ask a question at that point? Just yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm interested in this. Um, you would really like it, Vin. You would you would like it. I do it over a couple of days because it kind of take, takes a little while for your brain to wrap around stuff. And it is a little fatiguing too to be like, <sighs> but what have you? How do you can, can you can you verbalize? May, maybe it's too personal of things that were keeping you from doing stuff. So that people can have an example or if, I, if I've done this every year for like, I even have it in my Apple notes field. Cause every year you wind up with a whole new set of things for the next year. Right. And it's almost like, even if you don't achieve any of those things, <laughs> you've been able to look at where you have, where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are and how to like build your life moving forward from that. So something that would be, So if you look back on the things that you've done that you've accomplished that you're happy about and the things that you've done that you're not happy about or the things that haven't worked out, generally, you can look back and go, you can track your behavior to a certain extent, right? Okay. I trained for that race and I did that race is a real clear one, right? Right. right. Then there's other things that are not in your control. I'm going to you know, make $100,000 in commissions next year. If you're a salesperson, let's say you put that, I'm going to do it. I'm going to break six figures. And so closing that many sales might not be in your control, but there's a bunch of stuff that is in your control that you can do. So a lot of goal setting, why I don't like it is because it puts a lot of things outside of you. Like I'm going to, for example, if I say I'm going to get in a hundred new retailers now, I'm going to get my sauce in a hundred new retailers next year. Okay. Ultimately, I'm not the one who decides that it's in the hands of all these buyers. But what I can do is break that into actionable chunks of ways that I can reach out to get to buyers, to really like, you know, talk to distributors, talk to, you know, do the podcast, talk, really reach out to the, to the people and get, get the movement going. 
Right. But ultimately, I can't get inside the head of the Whole Foods buyer and say, say yes, because they could say no. And right. I could completely fail at that goal. And it feels like a failure. But if you look back on the year and you go, hold on, I've established a relationship with these four new distributors, with these people who've helped move things forward, with these things in the pipeline. And you kind of look back at it piecemeal like that, instead of looking at it from like this giant goal that you have. Because some people go, I want to weigh 120 pounds by next year. And then if they weigh 165 pounds, they beat themselves up for not getting to the 120 pounds. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, okay. So, uh, uh, hold on. Give me a second here. So what you do is coming up with new paradigms can sometimes feel very different. So one thing that I did here, I'll read one that I did. Um, two, you, you, you change your par- new paradigms into guidelines that you're going to look and you reread the stuff every day, kind of like the Napoleon Hill thing, reread the thing every day. And eventually, it, it, you're it, going- no, hang on. You've already, you know, I, I know what a paradigm is, but what explain what that means. You're changing okay. the paradigm. So, give us a real life. Let me give you an example of the, the way my brain works is I go a mile a minute and I have a million ideas in my head. And if I don't, I have learned now that if I don't write them down on the paper, they're going to be knocking around in my head, taking up real estate. Okay. Another thing that I've learned is that I have to do whatever my difficult task is for the day. I have to do that the first thing in the morning. Because? Because because I'll either get fatigued and won't do it. I'll postpone. uh, You know, I just have to do the difficult thing first thing in the morning because or else I have a tendency to want to punt it to later, punt it to later, punt it to later. And so I've learned, so a parrot, and that's a very general thing. So if I have a difficult email that I have to write to, if I'm afraid and then have to reach out to somebody who that I'm scared how this interaction is going to go, I'll just put it off for days and days and days, which I think is human nature. We don't want to, sure, but, sure. Uh, but for what I'm trying to build, I'm going to have to have some difficult conversations and make some big asks, right? So for me, at the beginning of this year, I had to say, okay, you're going to get done all of your cold calls and your cold emails first thing in the morning. Because when the day gets past you and there's all this other stuff to do, it's real easy to go, well, now it's too late. I can't call them. They're all going to be gone for the day. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I literally physically have to make myself sit down and do that because that's not something I enjoy doing. And I'm like, I'm not a salesperson. I don't like cold calling. Don't like it. But I know that about myself and I still have to make myself do it. So then you kind of set these things up for yourself. By the way, the book walks you through this whole process. You should just get the book and you pick the eight different places where your focus foci are like, I think, I think foci, foci, is, no foci is not a word. Focuses foci. I say foci. <laughs> Several Fo- focuses. Where your focuses are. So if it's, you know, uh, I gotta be a mom, I gotta be a wife. I got to be at, you know, at work. I've got to take care of my body. Uh, If your spirituality is important to you, or if you're, let's say you're at, you know, you teach at night or like whatever your things are, you come up with all of your goals. Now, if you're like most people, you have a million goals for every segment. Like I'm going to make my kids lunch every day. I'm going to talk to my kids about their feelings. As soon as I pick them up from school, I'm going to, and you could come up with like 10 mom goals. And what this thing, what this process does is it walks you through the process of pick one, pick one focus for each segment and make that your major focus. Like what's the most important thing? And so I, I kind of go from there. And uh, again, I've made it sound much more complicated than it is. Obviously she explains it, but I take a couple of days with it. And for the most part, I actually get these giant goals done and people ask me, how do you move stuff forward? And it's because I get really clear and honest with myself and I move major things forward in that way. I have to pick and choose what I'm going to do. Now there's a couple of goals that have been on the list for several years. And then you have to look at that and go, well, why has that thing been on there? And you haven't even come close to that thing. Got it. You know, you have to like be, be honest with yourself. And so, you know, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I'm old as dirt, just not quite as old as Vinny. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm old. You're old. 
I'm almost as old. So, you know, you've been doing it for a long time, but I highly recommend that. And, uh, and so I'm going to be doing that process and, but I don't have, I never do resolutions like, because resolutions to me say like, I resolve never to drink again, or I resolve to, I don't know, resolution feels like I am resolute. I am. Yeah, but I've noticed right. that things don't get done from that emotional place. It's like, remember you're talking to Ted and Ted just, you knew he made that decision. Right. And so this process helps you make that decision as opposed to like waking up hungover Sunday, January 2nd and going, okay, tomorrow I resolve to, it's probably not going to work. And that's why people fade away. Well, look, we know that most New Year's resolutions end within the month of January and very few, and, and we always make the joke, but it's very true. If you belong to a big box gym, try to get in there on January 2nd. Yeah. Good luck. Just we give it a couple of weeks, give it 10 you, days. You see faces you've never seen. Yeah, usually within the, the, the end of the second week. So right at about 12 days, 14 days. It's almost back to normal. And there will be the one or two guys or gals, the new faces you'll see that, that you know, once everyone clears out, you'll see the one or two new faces. And generally, if you see them after a month, you're going to see them for the whole year. Well, because that's the thing is just because you set a goal or a resolution doesn't mean it's going to help you establish a new habit. That's where it becomes a day by day recommitment to yourself until it really is just a habit. Yeah. Like look, with Vinny, I would say you have a habit of fitness. You're just going to get on and do your cardio. One of the things I tell people on the phone all the time is, you know, brushing your teeth and wiping your ass is not is nothing more than a habit. There are places in the world where people don't wipe their ass or brush their teeth. Right. They just don't. Go to India. I'm not kidding. <laughs> they walk, go to India and look for toilet paper. You walk into right. there's no toilet paper because no one's using it. Oh, God. I'm not making the and I, I'm not making this up. They have a bidet? No. Oh. You know, if you want if you want toilet paper, you might bring some in yourself. Like some places have toilet paper, but not all of them. Right. And I was like, man, everywhere I go, there's out of toilet paper. Wait, there's not even a, a place where the road. Oh, wait, they don't use toilet paper. And they know <laughs> that Westerners are going to use it. So they put it in the hotels and this kind of thing. But and by the way, the stuff you do get is like sandpaper there. There are places. You know, this is a habit, folks. Wiping your ass and brushing your teeth is a habit. You wouldn't think about it. Most people go, really? The people that don't wipe their ass? Yeah. We're the only animal that wipes our ass. Well, my dog might scoot on the ground if he's got something dangling. But that's about it. Okay. We're the only animal that does it habitually. We're the only animal that brushes our teeth habitually. No other animal does it. We had an opposing thumb so we can do it. There was a time in history when people didn't do it. Right. Toothpaste barely existed before the, the mid to late 1800s or something like that, you know? So if people did it, they, they just kind of wiped them down, switched it out. I don't know. The bottom line is we've created these habits. We couldn't imagine not brushing our teeth or wiping our ass. I couldn't imagine not exercising the same way. I've been doing it since I'm eight. And there are days when I have to miss. I don't go, oh, my God, I missed today. Oh, my, oh my God. But with me or people like me, okay, I had to miss Tuesday because I had to go do this and I had to do that. And I'm making a movie and I got to go get a shot or whatever, right? Okay, I missed. I don't go, oh my God, my whole week, my whole life is fucked up. Come back the next day, you do it. I don't do twice as much the next day. I'm trying to catch it up. You know, you just, okay, I missed. Right back on it. And it's got, exercise has to become that. Not just exercise, but anything you do where you're trying to make something, as Anna put it, habitual. You got to figure out a way to do it, right? And and momentum and inspiration and momentum have to be pretty strong to carry you into a new habit. So that's why, like, it's actually your belief systems that are going to create the new habit. Yeah. Because momentum only takes you so far. That's why people stop on January 12th to 15th. Yeah. And, and by the way, on that day when you have to miss because your boss says you have to stay late and get the papers done for, you know, the the uh, the, the Miffler account or whatever, you do it and then you come back the next day and, and you just move on, right? No matter what it is, you know, or let's say, you, let's say you're not an alcoholic, all right? So this doesn't count for alcoholics, but 
let's say you're non alcoholic, and you say, you know what, I'm not going to drink this year. And then on week three, you're somewhere, it slips your mind, someone hands you a glass of wine after work, and you, you drink the wine, you don't go, Oh, there I go. I just screwed up my New Year's resolution. Guess what? Halfway through that glass of wine, if you go, Oh, my God, I forgot this is what I'm doing this year, because it, if you don't drink wine every day, but you're doing that for this year, just jump right back on. Don't go, oh, well, I got, I'll wait another 12 months and I'll try again. No, start over right now. I tell, I tell you that to tell you this. When, you, when you're dealing with a diet, right, any kind of diet, whether it's NSNG, I, I don't like to call it a diet, but you understand a diet yeah. is what an indigenous people eat. And you go, oh, my God, I just had a French fry. I forgot, you know, because it's it, it, that'll it, happen. That actually happens. It's a muscle memory for most people. It's like your kids have when a I would cook fry. when I would cook Lucy's uh, mac and cheese when she was little, I would always take a bite while I was cooking and not even think about it. And then I would be like, oh, when we first started doing this, like, oh, wait, <laughs> right now, I wouldn't touch it, but it took a second. Right. Yeah. And you don't beat yourself up and go, well, I'm screwed up. I might as well bring on the donuts, honey, order a pizza. I just had a, a bite of mac and cheese. You don't do that. You just go, I'm, I'm right back on it. Yeah. Oh, ooh, ooh, I messed up. If anything, you go, oh, my gosh, I didn't realize how unconscious my behavior was that I would just eat that and not even think I was doing anything. Right. Right. It's and you go, wow, OK, that's interesting how the brain works. It's a real thing. Mm -hmm. And um, man, you know, it's it's up to you to get on top of it. And I want to move on a little bit. Yep, yep, yep. Um, you saw 14 peaks. Talk about a guy with a New Year's resolution. Yeah. I had nightmares all night after that, that I was falling off mountains. Really? Yeah. Because to me, it's not climbing the mountain, it's coming back down the mountain. That's what's scary to me. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Coming down is usually tougher than going up. I'm, I'm going to just be honest. Thank you. you. Um, people, the you steep know, hikes that I've done, it freaks me out to scramble down a mountain. There's, there's a term we use in mountaineering. Getting to the summit is optional. Getting home <laughs> is not optional. <laughs> Yeah, you got to get home. You, you know, you have to get home. Yeah. And I have so many questions for you after watching that movie, because there's some things they didn't explain about right. mountaineering that I have questions about. That's what I was going to say first. Um, someone like me or Cody Cod, who actually do a little light mountaineering, we know what it takes to get up those mountains. Right. But because they're trying to do all 14 peaks in 90 minutes, Coddington and I both agree it would have been much better if it was like a six or eight part series. Right. I even put six minutes at the beginning to give me some basics about how it works to summit and de-summit a mountain. Right. They just showed them kind of getting there. And look, the, the only thing that led you to know that it takes a long time was that they talked about how long it took Reinhold Mesner, who was in the movie. Right. Rein, Reinhold Mesner. The, the greatest <laughs> mountain climber of all time, you would say? Uh, no, yeah, that's Anatoly Bukharev. There's a few, yeah, and there's uh, Conrad Anchor. He he's up there. Yeah, yeah, he's probably the greatest living legend because he was the first guy. I want to say in the 1970s, but it might have been 80s, where they said, you know, after people had conquered Mount Everest, they said there's no way you could do it without oxygen. Right. Reinhold Mesner and I think his brother both. His brother ended up dying in, a, in an accident, <gasps> in an accident. But um, I'm Ryan surprised Mesner, more people don't. It looks insane. Oh, many of them do. When I was rock climbing, every other week you would hear about, hey, you know that guy, John, we met last week uh, up on- Yeah, uh, he died. Yeah, he fell off. He's gone. Yeah. At some point you start going, maybe I need to find another sport. <laughs> um, can, can real quick, 14 peaks, these are the 14 mountain ranges that are 8,000 meters or taller. 14 right. peaks, actual right. mountains. Yeah. And it's a thing to climb them. And R Mesner did it in how many years? Uh, I want to say Four, eight six years, eight years. Yeah. So, so it took him years to do it. I can't remember, but, um, you know, 
Yeah. And NIMS, NIMS was determined to do it within seven months. Yeah. He wanted to do all 14,000 peaks in seven months. 14 peaks in yeah. seven months. But, yeah. By the way, in case anyone is wondering what an eight, or 8,000 meters, that doesn't sound very high. That's over 26,000 feet. Okay. Uh, that, that's uh, K2, that's Mount Everest. Annapurna. Uh, yeah. Anna, Annapurna. I don't think I'm a Dublam. I'm a Dublam is like 22,000 or 21,000. Nope. But there, there's, um, there's all, all of the ones around the world. And insane. It's an insane, insane mountains. But what like, he, it, like some of them made Everest look like a walk in the park. I think what he was trying to do here, the, he, number one, the guy, the, the, the guys who are Sherpas from, you know, the, the Sherpa religion, right? They call them they call them Sherpas because all of their names is like, um, you know, uh, Pimba Sherpa or Ama Sherpa. You know, the, right. the last thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we know them as Sherpas. Sherpas are fat asses. Sherpas, <clears throat> to give you an example, will carry all of your stuff to base camp at Everest. They'll carry 140 pounds on their back. And yeah. they're kicking your ass up that mountain. And the way they do it, they have some kind of system where they have a band around their head and their neck is carrying the brunt of that weight. I, I don't know how they do it. But once they get there, then there are other Sherpas who work on the mountain to set up all the bridges across the ice falls and all this kind of stuff so that the Westerners can get across that. And they go up ahead of the Westerners and set ropes. So right. when you're ready to climb, you got a rope. There's a, a product called a Jumar. Mm -hmm. you know a Jumar is it? They didn't yeah. really show. You can hook it around a rope. It's like a handle in your hand. You hook it on a rope and it slides up the rope. And then you could pull yourself up, right. slide it up the road. I know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. and it's, it, the product is called a Jumar. Look it up and you'll see what, what I'm talking about. Um, I think it's spelled J-U-M-A-R. Anyway, um, these guys go up and down the mountain all the time because they are, they're predisposition because they live at high altitudes. They've trained at high altitudes. They don't need as much oxygen. They, yeah, they, they can just, they're mountain goats. And they're it's like incredible. the Michael they're the Michael Jordans of their sport. It's pretty amazing what they can do. At any rate, this guy wants to show that the Sherpas are the greatest people in the world. He wanted to bring and, some attention to the to the Nepali yeah, mountain climbers because athletes. it's all it's always European dudes getting the and American dudes getting the getting all the accolades getting the love. Yeah. So um, noble a, a noble cause. Yeah, this guy does it and he does it and and even you know the the, the great um uh what's his name i just mentioned in the italian um Messner, reinhold Messner. Messner, said that this is insane what he's trying to do is insane and he does it tell me start asking questions anna well first of all i kept thinking how is his wife so calm because she just must be ready for the call at any moment saying he's dead um you he know, must be yeah, ready for that call he was in the military yeah, uh, he, he, he's, he's already predisposed to being uh, an adventurer, to put it mildly. She's also from the region. Um, and this is what they this is kind of a life they know. Right. Right. So she knows this life. Um, when famously Rob Hall um, was up on, um, I want to say he was above the Lotsi face. And back in in the late 1990s, they did a movie called in, Into Thin Air. The, the book was mm -hmm. written in Thin Air by John Krakauer. Krakauer, that's right. I, I knew people up on the mountain that night. Um, that's when that the first big thing happened. It was somewhere in the early mid 90s. It, it's been a while now. Uh, Sandy Hill Pittman is someone who I I've known, and she was chronicled in the movie and in the book, not in a good way. Um, but Rob Hall, you know, was was one of the, the guides from New Zealand. And he knew he wasn't coming off of that mountain that night. And they passed him into his wife. And the whole world could hear it. You know, he was talking on a the radio, they mm -hmm. passed him into a phone at base camp and got it to New Zealand. And uh, he got to say goodbye to his wife. Oh, my God. And uh, oh, there, there's a lot of stories like that, where he, you know, he, he put her at ease and said, you know, I love you and, and I'll get off the mountain tomorrow. But everyone knew he wasn't getting off. Right. Was it? He was caught in the middle of a storm. He was out of oxygen. 
he was frostbitten and uh, he wasn't going to get up. Once they sit down, that's it. What this guy did was amazing. Go on, go on. Anna. Okay. Number one, you just said it. They're running out of oxygen. Right. Why don't they bring more oxygen? I, I know that seems like a simple question, but I go, really, you just don't have one extra tank? The guy, the one guy? Every ounce you carry, at some point, having extra oxygen would take away from being able to get up the mountain. Did you see the part? And this happens a lot. He found a guy on the mountain. Yep. And he stayed with him. Mm -hmm. And he called down below and said, can you guys please bring some oxygen up? Mm -hmm. And nobody and was willing to get up there. Well, they weren't nobody was willing or they didn't have oxygen there. That That's right. the two options. If they use that oxygen, they're in, they're in what's called the death zone. Once you get above 20,000, you're in the death zone. So for every minute you stay up there, you're dying. Your cells are dying off. And these guys are like, hey, if we thought we're now <laughs> crazy, we're now taking our own lives. So you, you want you now understand why I had nightmares about falling down a mountain yeah. all night after watching this. I get it. Um. Number two, how it seemed like, for example, K2 and the other two that I can't pronounce that begin with B, that all were kind of done in a row. Mm -hmm. How did he do that so quickly? He it did. seemed like, okay, because it he made did. it seem like it was one day up and one day down, one day up and one. I was like, it's at least four days, right, to get up Everest. Well, they made that. That's the part that. And these mounds are taller than Everest. And frankly, looked more dangerous. K2 looked insane with the K2 is sheet the of ice. K2 is the toughest mountain in the world. If you notice, uh, one out of every three people who try to summit K2 dies. Um, you know, very few people. Have, and, and people go, what's, hey. the highest, what's the highest mountain? Well, that would be Everest, but it's a walk up. It's a yeah. walk up. K2, you got to you got to know your shit. And yeah, the, the line, the traffic jam of people getting up Everest was crazy, too. Yeah, he took that famous picture last year mm -hmm. when he was doing it that, that was shown around the world. K2 is so technical and the weather is so much worse. And it, you can see K2 from Whit from Whitney, from uh, Everest. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's just it's the toughest. But now, you know what we're talking about in the movie when it made it seem like well, we went up to the top of this one, then we went down and then we went up to the top of that one, then we went down. I was like, what? They weren't showing all the, the stuff you got to remember. For people to get to base camp at, at Everest, which is, I think, at 17 or 18,000 That's where people are at base camp. And then they have to go up above the Kumbu Ice Falls, mm -hmm. acclimate there, and then come back down. And then they'll go up past the Kumbu Ice Falls and go up to what they call Camp 2 or 3. And then that's camp three. They'll stay there for a couple of days and just sit and acclimate, come back down, go through the ice falls, come back down, rest again. And then they'll make a push to, they'll go to camp four, they'll stay there. And at around midnight, they'll make a push to the summit. And that's what goes on out there, right? You go to camp, you acclimate, you come back down to 17, you go back up and you keep coming down once you acclimate it. They did times, not explain that at all. No, no, none of that was explained in this movie. These guys were acclimated because they they had been, you know, they're acclimated already and they've climbed something already. So they're still acclimatized. The uh, thing I'm showing you is, okay. is that in some cases, because of this, he raised money. Um, they didn't have to get, you know, Sherpas and yaks and every stuff. They had helicopters taking them up that part. Right. Mm. If they were up that part. Then they had to just do a summit push. Right. That's the only way to do something like this. Or if they even walked from the bottom, they weren't showing that two weeks of them walking from the bottom on the case. Right. Where That's what I'm push. saying. Like, I, I was like, how do they get how do they summit that one? Get back down and get up that one within 48 hours. No, 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 no. They, they didn't show they did a bad job of showing how long it takes and the minutia you have to, you know, as a matter of fact, the Chinese right. government had shut down climbing for the year. You saw that in the film. Right. On the final one. I'm guessing they were probably walking up the mountain to that level where they say you can't go any further. And they probably had some diplomats making phone calls and paying off the Chinese government. Probably. Because it takes weeks and weeks to get up to some of these. You know, right. first you have to fly there. 
then you have to, the one thing they didn't have to do was acclimatize because they were still acclimatized from the climb before. Well, I thought it was interesting when they showed him uh, passing the blood oxygen tests, the, the one where they had the thing over his face. Right. And passing that blood oxygen test with obviously flying colors. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, these guys, um, you know, they're never hurting for um, blood oxygen ever. This, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is pretty amazing. And um, so, yeah, it, they made I it. I highly recommend you guys see it, especially as somebody who doesn't know anything about mountain climbing. I, I found it really fascinating, but, but I did have questions. So I thank you for answering that. No, that was part, mostly it. The part that drove Coddington and I nuts was that they made it seem to the, the regular person like you, like, oh, they just flew here and then bop, 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 bop. Oh, no, 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 no. There's yeah. a lot of hiking in. That's why you have your Sherpas with you. That's why you have, you know, people to porter stuff for you. There's all of the stuff that goes on. Well, it must be or else everyone would do it. No, it, it's an undertaking. I, so it's like, yeah. So I was like, oh, I knew that they were glossing over some things for sure. Oh, yeah. Th there was money and... um there's a great book and it's out of print. I met the guy about six months before he died in an avalanche. And I've talked about him on this show. Oh, before. The avalanches are a whole nother level of yeah. nightmare. Yeah. That's something else that that's, you know, for climbers who do everything right, that can still take you out. But a uh, urine crop spelled Gorin, G O R A N K R O P P wrote a book. I think it's called ultimate high. Uh, his copy is signed to me and it's not here anywhere, but it's in his. Um, I met him in Santa Barbara before he passed away. He, <clears throat> he went from Switzerland under his own power, carrying everything that he was going to climb Mount Everest with on a bike with a trailer behind him. He had to go across the Sahara Desert and, and other places like Lord. Pakistan and all this stuff where he was being shot at and all this stuff. He rode 6,000 miles on a bike. Where he took you mean like a motorcycle, a bicycle, human a power. bicycle, bicycle. The only time he could not do the human power was he had to take a ferry or two to get to another thing. Right. So 6,000 miles with all of his gear on the bicycle. He then got to base camp, but he had 140 pounds worth of stuff to carry. He couldn't carry it all at once, so he stored half of it behind some rocks. He walked everything up to base camp at Everest, like 80 pounds worth of stuff, went back, got the rest of the stuff, carried that up. He had no nothing, no Sherpas, no nothing. And he did use the, um, the ladders that are put across the Kumbu Ice Falls right. that you have to go across because, you know, I was even, wondering that. Did they leave those ladders there for people? Or do you bring your no, ladder with you? Your Sherpa brings no, a ladder? No, the Kumbo Ice Falls are constantly moving. So you have to bring a ladder. They, they're, they're always... No, the Sherpas are bringing all the ladders up, but the ladders are constantly being moved because the ice falls are moving. Right. That it's makes sense. moving, yeah. living thing. Um, as a matter of fact, urine crop went up the year when all those people died. I was talking about mm -hmm. you know, Ron Hall, Rob Hall and all those people. And Fisher died and all those other guys died. And uh, uh, Yasuka Namba. Yeah, I can remember all the names of these people from years ago. Anyway, he was the first one to put ropes up that high that year. He failed. He didn't make it up. He didn't make it to the top um, because he, he got diarrhea or something. He lost it. He came back down and he was talking to to Fisher and Rob Lowe, uh, Rob Lowe, um, Rob Hall and all those people that night because he was the only person that had broken trail up there. They had him trying to get those people down. And as a matter of fact, a few days later when he attempted again and finally get the summit, the first person who did it completely under human power, he, um, he was the person who took Fisher's body and birds were already plucking his eyes out. He covered him. And he threw him off the mountain, you know, so that people wouldn't have to walk over his body for millennia. To get to oh, my God. Yeah, there's a lot of bodies on the hill, by the way. They don't they don't bring them down. That's one of the services that so many Sherpas offer now. They'll go up and find your loved one and bring them down so that you can have a proper burial. Well, God bless the Sherpas then. Yeah, th these guys do amazing work. 
So um, um, I feel like on that note, we should end the show. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, but you're so, uh, go hike Everest, guys. Yeah, go do that. You can die. Uh, uh, urine crop brought everything that he brought up the mountain. He took down with him and then rode 6,000 miles back home. One that of the guy's a badass. Out. Yeah, he's a complete badass. He's no longer with us. You know uh, what? You know what he could have brought with him? Villa Capelli. Yeah. Yeah, he could have. I bring Villa Capelli when I'm on the out and out when I'm when I'm out there. You know that I put I put my ultra salt in it. Yeah. Um, I it's bring it along stuff. with my own ultra fat. You know, people go, why don't you just use the ultra fat? Because I like different tastes, you know. Oh, yeah. Different. Why Change not? It up. Variety. Yeah. Why not? So I I've do had both well. today. I had one of your ultra fats today and I've had Villa Capelli today. Boom. Look at Boom. you. And bacon. So I've had all three my three favorite fats. Villa Capelli is the best olive oil on the planet. People, we're not just saying that because they if, you, pay if you're coming back to the show after a while because you're like, this is it. I'm going to I'm gonna, first of all, go get Vinny's PDF right now and reread it. Second of all, go order Villa Capelli olive oil. You're going to need it when you're cooking your dinner, when you're making your lunch, when you're making a salad dressing, when you're frying up some stuff, you're going to love it. Don't do what I did and only use it in salads for years because you're too cheap to cook it. You have to cook it because it really I makes all the flavors of stuff I'm come to life. It everything. It's so good. Um, Villa Capelli, the best olive oil on the planet. Use the discount code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, to get 10% off your order every time. So go to villacapelli.com, use the discount code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, get 10% off. Support them. They support this podcast. Happy New Year, bitches. There you have it, folks. If you want to check out everything Anna Vicino is doing, go to annavicino.com. She also has Anna Vicino dot substack dot very good net com com and of a chino dot substack dot com I'm gonna, I'm gonna train you yet yeah i'm gonna get there it just takes me a month and <laughs> um go check that out also her eat happy kitchen products are out there she's You're gonna need the sauces more. this winter people you will and look walk into your grocery store and go hey guys why don't you have this yet and they'll go wait what and then they'll get it and then you'll get it and that's what it I, worked in Atlanta at Little's Food Shop. Somebody walked in and demanded it. And then the guy wrote me and, and we got it in the shop. Perfect. That, it's that, worked that, in that, other that, places. It worked in that Arizona place in the Tubac market. Yeah. So it's it's starting to get out there, guys. So go check it all out. Anavacino.com, the books. Thank you. you want to check out Anavacino. Uh, oh, and if it's January 3rd, you can go download that meal plan that I have at the site. Boom. It 31 days of Eat Thursday. Happy. So go oh, do it. Raining here. I need to go it for is. my walk. Oh yeah. man. Um, folks, you know what to do with me. Before you go to Amazon, go to vinnytotters.com, click through the banner. It puts coal on the fire, gets my train down the track, and I'm able to keep this show free. For oh, you guys got money. Amazon gift cards for Christmas. You're gonna use them. Make sure you do that. Definitely go to Vinny Tortorich and click through the Amazon banner. Oh, I'm gonna tell you this. This is coming out on the third. If you haven't bought my movie yet, um, you can mm. go to iTunes and do that. It's coming out on the 11th. So I'm going to tell you guys, if you go to VinnyTordrich.com, smack in the middle of where you land is the little Beyond Impossible. There's a strip that says Beyond Impossible and has the little green poster on it. Click that and it'll open it right where you should pre-order it. Yeah. Is it coming yeah. out January 11th? Yeah, we're doing one more show, right, Anna? Yes, let's do the Beyond Impossible show. Yeah, so we this show comes out when? On the 3rd? 3rd. So yeah, we'll we, have a show out the 10th and then it comes out the next day, Tuesday, the 11th. Yeah, so, so, yeah. I'm so excited yeah, I, for everybody. I, can't wait. I, can't, I, I just can't it's wait. It's so good, you guys. Hey, Dr. Drew went nuts over it. And, and he's, Dr. Drew has had me on every show you could put me on. Because Great. He loves this movie that much. Um, so, folks, on behalf of Anna Vocino, my name is Vinny Tortorich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm. <laughs>